Welcome to the Church Online Campus. We are so glad you are joining us. If at any time during the message tonight you have a question or you'd like to connect with us, go ahead and join our live chat to the right of the screen. One of our online hosts would be more than happy to connect with you. For more information about our church, go ahead and visit welcometothechurch.com. Here's five things for you real quickly. Number one today in this message, may you be encouraged. May you be strengthened in the inner man. May you be built up, edified. May you be comforted and pointed to Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And may you know that God loves you beyond a shadow of a doubt and cares about you and your need in life. In the book of Isaiah, you don't have to put this one up, but if you're taking notes this morning, Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Of course, we know the angels and the six angels that covered him, and they were uh, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Of course, Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And, but what I want to share with you this morning about this is it comes from Philippians 4, 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus our Lord. And uh, the train of his room, uh, the, it, what, when, what, uh, I, what he saw was uh, Jesus high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And managing uh, in the Jewish culture, the, 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 the emphasis is on the bridegroom, not the bride. But in American culture, it's more on the bride because she gets the white dress on, gets the flowing train and all that. But in the Jewish culture, uh, uh, the train of Jesus' robe filled the temple. And that means... In symbolism and types and shadows, it means is that Jesus never runs out of anything. He's got everything he needs to fulfill your need. So he said, uh, that's why he said uh, uh, in, uh, he'll, in Philippians 4, 19, he'll supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So in the Jewish culture, the longer the robe on the man showed the wealth wherewith he was able to take care of his bridegroom and family. And that's just a nugget to get us started to, to uh, this one here this morning as we keep going. So may you in Jesus' name, like Daniel and the three Hebrew children, may your lives be customized to meet the needs uh, of an evil world without compromising your own personal character. And um, so uh, have you ever had anybody rejoice over you? When you got saved, were people happy? Were they shouting? Were they glad? I want to tell you something. God was more glad. And, of course, through them, he, that was an expression of his love to you through them. But in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 13, it says this, and this is King James, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, and he will save, and he will rejoice over thee with joy, and he will rest in his love, and he will joy over thee with, thee with singing. So what you see here is the word uh, rejoice is a festival that is taking place. It's pleasure. It's uh, a time of joy and happiness. And then it says, uh, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee, he will joy over thee with singing. This comes from, a, the word joy here comes from a Old Testament word meaning gheel, G-H-E-E-L. And it means to uh, uh, be, a, it, it's kind of like this. You ever seen somebody that was just uh, going fanatical? They were so happy, just bah, 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 and spinning around. Well, that's what God is doing up there when somebody gets saved. He just starts spinning with violent emotions. It's real violent. So God was, God's happy when somebody gets saved. Amen? And we're happy when somebody gets saved. Amen? And give their heart and their life to the Lord Jesus. So we're called to rejoice when people give their heart to the Lord. Here we go. Uh, just kind of an intro here to get uh, some nuggets getting into Luke chapter 15 with us this morning. I'm going to read the text and then we're going to really uh, uh, flow down through here with this. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to Jesus. Look at who was drawing near to Jesus. Tax collectors, people that uh, weren't well liked and uh, uh, during that time and they were all and the sinners were drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. How many of you know somebody always grumbles? Uh, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. I'm sure glad he received me. How many say amen? And so he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls his friends and neighbors 
saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. It doesn't mean that he wasn't happy for the 99. It just lets us know that we're to be happy for and have joy for the one who comes to Christ. So I got a, uh, we're going to read from uh, uh, John chapter uh, 10. And uh, I hope to uh, uh, read a, uh, I got a turn there. Okay, so I'm going to go to John chapter 10. You know, the Lord didn't have this problem because he's a living, walking word. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, so I'm going to read this to you this morning from uh, John chapter 10. Verily, verily, I tell you, Pharisees, uh, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs up some other way as a thief and a robber, and the one who enters... Uh, uh, by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep and the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out and when he has brought out all his own he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice but they will never follow a stranger in fact they'll run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice on down, on down in verse 26, it says this. If, uh, it says, uh, verse 27, pardon me. Uh, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Uh, have they got uh, my picture of my sheep following the shepherd up there? There they are. Amen. So here is a, a shepherds leading the sheep, and they're following close behind. Is there just one of them up there, or is there two of them? I can't remember for sure what they had uh, uh, ready for me. But if it's just the one, that's fine. So you get a picture of what happens. So how the, the question is in this parable, in this story that Jesus is telling how did he know? How did the shepherd know that one was missing? Well, the key is he counted them every morning. He counted them every morning. We just read a scripture. It says he knew each one by name. Okay? So we know that there are people who have never been saved or haven't been saved, need to be saved, and we want to see them ha saved, and we're going to be happy when they do get saved. And uh, so... What we see in this story is, is how much the shepherd really loves somebody who's lost. He really cares about them. And so uh, we see how much he, what he feels and how he's feeling when one is missing. He sees the, the sheep is gone. He gets concerned for that sheep when it is missing. And so uh, he knows that there, and the reason he gets concerned is, is that he knows that there are things out there that can harm that sheep. And so he counts the sheep. It doesn't take him long to determine that one is missing. And, uh, and the reason is because they're numbered in name, as I said. But why? Why? Because he loves the sheep and knows that sheep by name. I've watched your shepherd calling and texting people who he knows you by name, just like Jesus would do and making contact and then letting them know how much he's glad to see that they were in the service. How many can say amen to that? Amen. amen. And so one of these days when you're running a thousand people and you don't get the text message from this shepherd, know that he's got another shepherd watching that's making sure that you're contacted. Amen. That'll never stop. That'll never stop. And so he heads out. In search of that sheep, and he makes sure the 90 and 9 are cared for. He doesn't leave the 90 and 9 unattended because shepherds traveled in groups and they never left sheep unattended. So he leaves the 90 and 9, he pursues after the sheep that is gone and straight away, and he starts calling by name. He calls you by name, and he calls. The reason he starts calling that sheep by name is to let the sheep know that he's there. Okay? Now, and he lets you as an individual know that he has this thing covered. He says, my sheep know my voice. 
He listens for the cry of the sheep. And he never leaves you and never forsakes you. Now what happens to a sheep when they get out there in territory that they have never been in before, there's places that look like it's comfortable. And they might see a little gully. And they lay down in that little gully. And what happens is they get in what's called a cast position. C-A-S-T, cast. Like this. Okay? This is what's called a cast position. Now, there's a problem with this position. When a sheep gets off in a place like this, and they think that it's a safe place to rest, and they end up on their back. He is actually in a very helpless situation. The sheep is in a helpless situation. The reason is, if you know anything about sheep, and I'm still learning about them today, okay, is that when he's on his back like this, he can't get up by himself. This is a, a cat can get up. A dog can get up. Uh, uh, but the sheep cannot. And so he needs a shepherd to get the sheep back up. Now, by the way, oh, I got to look out here. Oh, my, 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 my. Norby, you want to try to trust me? All right, would you mind coming, brother? I know, what I need you to do, Norby, is I need you to just lay down right here on your back. <laughs> Norby, this morning, is a sheep. He's in the cast position. Okay? All right. Hope this is all right, brother. <laughs> uh, you don't have to lift your feet. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> all right. So let me go on here while we're uh, doing this. So, okay, fear has... <laughs> is that all right, Norby? We, we good, man? All right, all right. All right I'm, I'm, I'm an ex-Marine, so we're good, man. All right. Fear has gri gripped the sheep's heart, so what does a shepherd do? He's calling out. Hey, Norby, how many of you know Jesus knows exactly where you're at? Your pastor talked about that last week. From the, uh, the beginning of time, the middle of time, until the end, he sees the whole picture. He knows everything that's going on, okay? So... The shepherd's out there in the human part of it. The shepherd's calling out, and, and he's, saying, he's saying to, Hey, Norby, Norby, where are you at? You know why he's calling out to Norby? He knows Norby's name. Do you know why he's calling out to Norby? Because Norby hears a voice, and he hears the voice of the shepherd. Okay? And so all of a sudden, the sheep realizes it's the shepherd's voice and the sheep goes I'm, <laughs> I'm right here <laughs> he thought I was going to go mad <laughs> okay and uh, so calls out but here's the deal here's the deal. Jesus knows exactly where you're at he knows exactly the situation you're in he knows exactly how to find you because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost but he also watches over and cares for those because he says, care, cast all your care upon me because I care for you. And those that come to him, it says he will no way turn away. And so he bends down and he talks to the sheep. When I was in the hospital getting a, a little operation, I've been lucky I had much wrong with me in my life. I was getting kind of fidgety because they had your hands down there, and I don't like to be tied down, okay? I don't know anybody that does. And that nurse came over and went like this. You doing all right? Okay? And that's what the shepherd does. Jesus, he comes along. He bends down and says, hey, Norby. Norby, everything's going to be all right, man. Get back up there. There we go. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so he's talking to the sheep. He tells the sheep, hey, Norby, Jesus is talking, okay? Norby, I love you. Norby, I care about you. He pours in the oil. He pours in the wine. And he sees that sheep is no longer afraid. And then he does something. Next slide. 
He does something. He picks that sheep up. And you're going to have to help me just a little. <laughs> he picks the sheep up, okay? And uh, anyway, <laughs> we're going to do this one way or the other, brother. Amen. All right? I want you to lean across my shoulder. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> you're good. You're good. We're all right. Now, I'm not too good of a shepherd here. Okay, but as he's got the sheep picked up, if you'll notice, Norby's ear is closer to my mouth than ever before. There, see that guy carrying that sheep up there? And then he's going along and saying, Norby, man, I've had your back all the time. Norby, I love you. Norby, I love you with an everlasting love, and I'm never, never, never going to forsake you. Never. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. I want a very good shepherd. I couldn't pick Norby up. <laughs> but he was willing to help me out here this morning, okay? Here's the deal. The safest place you can be is on the back or the shoulders of the shepherd. That's where that mouth is close to the ear of the sheep. It's there that you hear the compassion and the voice that says, I love you, I'll never forsake you, as we did with Norby. I love you with a love that is everlasting. I'm here for you. I care about you. And that's why we see David penning the Psalm, 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. We all know this right well. The interesting thing about the shepherd as he leads the sheep. And this slide's not up there. I don't think they have the one up there with the sheep going across the, the valley. But there's a reason why that the sheep follow the shepherd. The shepherd will never lead them into turbulent places. Or if they are in a turbulent places, the shepherd knows how to get the sheep out. He'll never leave them in a valley. Because in Israel... When the mountains, they're like, kind of like over here, can come a flash flood at any time. And when the sheep are down here across in this valley, that's called a wadi. And in the wadi, there's places where there's like muck and stuff. And if the sheep get caught in that muck and stuff, the sheep will get stuck in there. And the flash flood comes along. Then the sheep would drown. So the shepherd knows exactly where to lead the sheep. So when the shepherd got home, he called everybody, and everyone said, Rejoice with me. At home, they saw him coming, and they celebrated. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so when people get saved, it gives heaven a reason to rejoice. What was Jesus the shepherd doing today? He's left the sheep with somebody while he goes after one that's lost. He leaves it with a shepherd. Going after the lost sheep, Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. How many can say amen? amen. Who was that sheep that was astray? It was me, September the 20th, 1975. 10 o'clock at night. And as your pastor said, I looked up and it was my hand in the air. But there was never more comforting words than when I heard, I see that hand, brother. I knew at that moment things had changed for me. But I did go to the altar. I didn't know what to say. Somebody asked me, he's dead now, the guy that prayed with me. He said, what, do you want to pray? I says, yeah, I might as well. I don't know anything else to do. I didn't even know how to pray. He led me in a sinner's prayer. I left there a new person. The shepherd Jesus had come looking for me. The world is in a cast position. And one of the things that lets us know it doesn't matter what we've done, God still loves you. He calls out to us. 
It doesn't matter how heavy your load is today. Newbie could have been a little lighter. <laughs> he can carry you through to victory. <laughs> Just kidding you, newbie. Newbie. Norby. I get the name right. <laughs> I was practicing your name, Norby, 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 so I wouldn't forget it. But he'll carry you through to victory. Jesus called. And Jesus is calling you if you're sitting here. Listen, because he's calling your name. He knows you. He knows where you're at. You can read this later, but I'll just ad lib it. In Luke chapter 7, there was a woman. Jesus had went to a guy's house. And this is in Luke chapter 7, verse 36. He went to this guy's house, and it was custom in those days. When you go to somebody's house, you wash your feet off. You know, they've been walking on the roads. They didn't come up driving in a car. You know, they had stepped in some things on the roadside. It was kind of that way then, you know. The roads wasn't paved. The camels had to do things, and they just went everywhere. So their feet were dirty. It was customary in those days to wash the guest's feet. And this guy had not washed the guest's feet. But this woman had seen and heard that Jesus was there. And she came in with an alabaster box with oil in it and began to pour it on Jesus' feet and was crying on, crying on, uh, and washing his feet and then drying her, his feet with her hair. you got to understand. And then these, 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 uh, this guy said, if Jesus knew what kind of a woman that was, he wouldn't even allow her to touch him. And he said it, and Jesus knew it. Here's the interesting thing. This woman was a, 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 a prostitute, and, and she seen this need in Jesus for Jesus to have his feet washed. So that with which she seduced men, the perfume and the oil and her hair that made her look pretty, she began to, to nurture Jesus and wash his feet. And Jesus said to him, I came into your house and you didn't wash my feet. Yet this woman come and wash my feet. Her sins are forgiven. That's what the story says. Her sins are forgiven. I'm convinced this was Mary Magdalene. I know it doesn't say, but we know there's a Mary Magdalene that got saved and followed Jesus. I think this might have been her. So who was that woman who came in washing Jesus' feet? Might be one of us. Then there's the woman who was, Jesus was going by and the disciples went on in John chapter 4. You can read it later. And Jesus is leaning against the well. This woman comes up to him. She's a Samaritan woman. She says, Jesus says to her, give me a drink. She says, whoa, wait a minute. We're Samaritans. We're dogs. And you're Jewish. I can tell you're Jewish. And it's had to do with his clothing. And and she said, Jews don't have anything to do with us. He said, if you would have known the water that I have to give, you'd ask me a drink, and I'd give you water springing up into everlasting life. She said, I see, I see, I perceive that you are a prophet. He said, go call your husband. She said, I have no husband. He said, you're right. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. You know who that woman was? That was me. I'm just a woman at the well. We're just women at the well. And we come, and Jesus said, give me a drink, and he gave us a drink of living water. And we got everlasting life. I mean, say amen to that one. Amen. amen. She leaves, takes off, goes to town, said, come and see a man that told me everything I ever done. The whole town come out to see him. The whole town come out. And so now we don't believe because you told us, but because we've seen for ourselves. One more. This woman was in a cast position. I'm sure there's some men in the Bible too, guys, that were in some pretty bad <laughs> position. But And these guys come, these Pharisees come and said, hey, Lord, this woman was taken in a very act of adultery. What the law says, we're supposed to stone him. What do you say? Of course, you all know the story. He was trying to They were trying to trick Jesus. Jesus kneels down. He's writing something on the ground. Everybody's been trying to figure out what it was. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay? Figuring out, trying to figure out what he said doesn't matter what. What he did say is what matters. He said, you are without sin, cast the first stone. And so he, they, one by one, began to drop their stones, and they left. And pretty soon, pretty soon, she's standing there all alone. She said, well, he said, woman, where are your accusers? She 
He said, she said, there are none. He said, neither do I accuse you. Have you noticed up to this point he's never addressed her sin? He says, and go and sin no more. So I said, that's how much love the shepherd has for us. Doesn't matter what situation we're in. Doesn't matter what situation we've been in. Jesus loves you. Amen. Our children, our family, our friends, believers in the church can get into this cast position once in a while where we're on our back and we don't know what to do and we don't know how to get out. And so what they don't need from me, I don't need to help kill them. How many say amen to that one? They need our love. You might have family, friends, and neighbors whom you care about, and you want to invite them to a house that's going to introduce them to Jesus. A house that's not going to shoot them. A house that's not going to turn them away. A house that's going to embrace them. A pastor that's going to embrace them. A pastor that's going to teach them the truth and lift them up in the things of God. Because this is a safe place. If it wasn't safe, you wouldn't be here. A few years ago, a lot of years ago, I won't tell you who the pastor was. I know him personally. But he was telling the, he's telling the Lord in prayer before the church services, or some time before church started, Lord, send in all the pimps, send in all the prostitutes, send in all uh, these people. And God said, no. And he said, wait a minute, God, God, bring it. He said, no, no. He said, I'm not going to do it. You're not ready. So service getting ready to start that evening. He goes in. It's two minutes before service, and right down the middle aisle comes a, a lady, and she has such a short skirt on, there's nothing left to be imagined. Okay, this is a true story. This is a true story. She comes down, sits right on the front row. She, he said, oh, my goodness, where's the usher at? I've got to get her out of there. And God said, I told you, you wasn't ready. And that night he preached, that woman was sitting on the front row, and he made the altar call, and that lady got up and gave her heart to Jesus. And a lady came up in church, oh, pastor, I'm so glad this girl got saved. I've been witnessing her for weeks to come to this church. That church run 3,000 people. And the pastor found out from God that he wasn't ready yet. Are you ready? Are you ready? It's a good place to talk if you want to. It's okay. <laughs> Amen. And so what they need is our help. They need to see and hear the voice of the good shepherd flowing through you because that's how Jesus is reaching out today is through the body of Christ to believers. And Jesus is carrying you and speaking to people through you, the church, and Jesus is, you, through you, using you to bring words of encouragement and comfort and then carry them to safety into the sheep fold. There is nothing too big for God to carry. Nothing. God, God, God. Romans 5 eight. God demonstrates his love for us. And while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. We can cast all of our care upon him because he cares for us. How many say amen? amen? Amen. Thank you for listening to this old preacher <laughs> who almost dropped Norby. <laughs> you trust me, Norby? <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal. Can people trust you? Can they trust you to carry them to a place of safety? Because you're going to give them a comforting, encouraging word. You're going to bring them through the doors of this building. This pastor over here is going to deliver a message. And you're going to rejoice. You may lead them to the Lord yourself. But if they do it right here, you have helped. You have carried them. Jesus has used you as his voice to speak into their ear an encouraging word that there is hope.
It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter how bad they've been. It doesn't matter what lifestyle they're in. It doesn't matter if they're prostitutes or lesbians or gay. Jesus is going to save them because he loves them, and he will love them through you. Thanks again for joining us at The Church Online. If you'd like to give towards the mission and the vision of the church, go ahead and press the Give button at the top of the screen. Be sure to tune in next week for the start of a brand new series called True Christianity. We hope you have a great week.